focus tree. Italian. Focus tree. Soviet. Focus tree. Someone. Please. Just one dev diary. Here friend. Take this. An Estonian focus tree. Nobody. Is that. Desperate. Wait. No. It can't be. Is that? Oh, it is. Yes, hello, and welcome everyone to the Soviet Union Dev Diary. This has been long awaited by so many people, myself included, so I'm happy that we're going to be going over it, looking what's inside, talking about some of the stuff, and giving our overall opinion. But briefly, just before I begin, I want to say thank you to everybody who has subscribed thus far. I've just started teetering around the 8k mark, which is a real achievement, <laughs> I never thought I'd get this far. So thank you to everyone, and to those of you who haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. It gives me great enthusiasm and encouragement to continue making these videos. So if you do enjoy them, feel free to like, and feel free to subscribe. Right, let's begin. So this mammoth dev diary begins by talking about how all of the content you see in this dev diary is free. It's all because the original Soviet focus tree was part of the base game, so this is going to be free as well. So you don't need any DLC for this part, which is jolly good. Although they do say there are minor branches that may require some minor DLCs, but for the most part, all free. We of course get to see the new information screen when you get to pick your country, and we can see that Stalin has had his name change to Yosef, where previously it was the anglicised Joseph. This changing of names is probably going to be a recurring theme throughout the Stev Diary and the future of the Soviet Union, which is more in key with how other countries have been dealt with, so bye bye Papa Joe. We can also see some of the focuses you can go for during this campaign regarding Trotsky, Stalin and the overall Communist Bureau. And so from there the game begins, with 1936 Russia looking like this. Josef Stalin now has a starting trait which gives him minor buffs and debuffs, um, I think the improved relations opinion's kind of funny. I think that's in there as a little joke, but I think it's cool all the same. As well as the fact that war support has downed below 50% now, so rushing to get your war economy up in 36 is not a valid strategy. You may also see that there are now six starting national spirits, which I think that has to be the most out of any country at the start of the game. Some of them okay, some of them bad, but I'm sure we'll get into it as we go along. Two of those national spirits you will of course recognise are Home of the Revolution with its Can Create Factions and Ideology Drift Defence, if for some reason the common turn is destroyed and you need to whip it back up into shape again, and the Trotskyist plot, which is always looming, perhaps somewhere in Mexico, but you never really know these days. In addition to your 1936 start, you also begin with a political advisor. Now you start with a head of the NKVD, which as things progress and certain purges take place, can be replaced, and replaced again. Your starting head of the NKVD Yugoda isn't particularly good, but the two to follow give decent enough upgrades, although the stability hit is not nice. Although I don't think Berry is very nice to be honest either. In addition to your starting advisor, you also have more options of advisors to pick from at the beginning, including the Iron Lazar, uh, the People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, there's lots to pick from in here, um, although whether you're going to spend your political power on this so early, I'm not too sure about, but they're all there all the same. And with changes into generals, there have been more generals added to the start of the game in 36, with five marshals. The Dev Diary brings note to one particular general, being Vitaly Primokov, who is a cavalry division leader. What you can note about him is that he does have a trait available to get, and the legendary hat general icon is now accessible from the general selection screen, seen just underneath the number 3. Right, and so with the 1936 start covered, you've seen the generals, the advisors and the spirits, you can now get to see the focus tree. And might I say, it's very wide. Um, I think they're going more so for there's a lot of bases you have to cover with this focus tree, but they don't go down too far so it's going to heavily rely on choosing the paths you want to go down, because you're not going to be able to do all of them before Germany comes for you. I will also say that underneath this classified section, 
there's probably going to be something to do with Trotsky and probably something to do with two other Soviet leaders with lots of alt history to do there. But if you look off to the very far right, you can see that the line carries on off screen, which means in terms of non-communist alt history, we have no idea how much more this tree has to offer. So for the preservation of viewer sanity, and my sanity included, this dev diary can be broken down with its focus tree into very individual smaller branches. We can do the same by starting with the industrial branch. So a quick overview of the industrial branch seems pretty traditional hoi for to be honest, with its heavy industry, its infrastructure efforts, there's the rail networks, and some focuses to do with resources. It all seems pretty traditional hoi for. So looking at what those individual focuses do is what's really interesting. So keeping in touch with the history of the Soviet Union, we follow the path from the initial revolution and how the industry had to develop using these five-year plans, and it's that which the industry branch follows. So one of those starting spirits we saw in 1936 is the second five-year plan from 33 to 37, which means this plan is already in effect at the game start and gives you consumer good factories debuff, but a very minor buff to civilian factory construction speed, which probably isn't the best. What you're working towards is your third five-year plan between 38 and 42, which will be far better than the one you previously had, giving you better buffs, better construction speed buffs, and research speed buffs. So in total, the key way this branch works is working towards the third five-year plan, and then taking the focuses as you go down to get better buffs for it to ensure that you can have the strongest economy base for building up your industry. This does, however, come with a small problem. Germany. Because all problems come from Germany. The focuses you can see here that are primarily to do with improving that third five-year plan can become locked out of entirely when you're at war with a major, which effectively means that you're screwed if you don't take these early enough before Germany invades you, as they are likely to do. So prioritising your industry at some point is pretty important to do. If, however, you manage to survive against the Germans, which I hope you all succeed in doing, there is more focuses below that in restoration and development, which weirdly is actually about a post-game Russia. After you've perhaps pushed back the Germans all to Berlin, you can begin rebuilding the country, and there's a focus to begin the fourth five-year plan from 46 to 1950s. This is super interesting to me because I do wonder if this is them suggesting that they're considering more sort of late game and even post game content, or is this just one of those flavorful things for those people who really want to master the Soviet world conquest, which is sometimes can go to the 1950s. Regardless, these little bits of flavor, for me, they just make the game. They're so cool. It gives you something to strive for and work for even after you've finished what is traditionally World War II. It gets better though because you can form the Comcon. Comcon. The C O M E C O N. What this does is it allows you to start building up inside subjects and puppets and territories that you've gained from the war of World War II. In many ways, I compare this to how the Marshall Plan could work in terms of building up your allies for a potential Cold War. And it really does make me think. I hope they go back to America and give America the same thing, the Marshall Plan, so that they can build up their friends in Europe too. But anyway, as we see here, every Soviet subject gets an absolutely grip strong hold over them by the Soviets. Um, your master ideology drift goes up, you can't get freedom by trade, your subject manpower requirement is just gone so they can build up an army. It's completely shifting, like, how a puppet works. It kind of makes me think it's almost like a unique form of puppet as a spirit. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, but I do think it's really cool. And here we can see an image of the Comcon building up inside some of its puppets. We've got Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria, lots of Eastern Europe. And by using civilian factories, you can get construction speed and consumer good reduction to build them up even stronger. The right side of the tree is dedicated to specialists and how they improve your research and other smaller buffs. The key point is you've got a mutually exclusive decision between using the national Russian specialists or getting foreign experts to come in and provide you with help. 
Since national designers have been weakened, the national specialists focus will give them some basic buffs to make sure they're up to speed with the rest of other countries. While on the other hand, we have the Gosproyet... Listen, I'm sorry, I can't say that word. Shoot me in the street, but I'm sorry. Anyway, the foreign-owned companies with foreign experts can come in and help with the Russian construction. It's important to note that going with the foreign experts does give buffs to construction, but not to research. They're not going to give you their secrets. They're just here to help. And the final part of the industry branch. Yep, this is just the industry branch. This is a monumental dev diary. It's talking about the USSR Academy of Sciences, which is effectively your research slot. What's far, far more interesting though, is in addition to that research slot, you also get a 1% research speed. Now, I know that's not a lot. However, once you do this, you get decisions to build up that research speed by integrating more Academy of Sciences into territories, puppets, and other areas that you own. As we can see here, there's just a giant list of places you can build Academy of Sciences, each one giving you another research speed, which stacks up more and more. If I was to give one criticism though, judging by how many there are, and how expensive it is at 50pp, I'm not sure if people can dedicate this much to it. I mean, how many years do you have before the Germans invade? I don't think people can afford to spend like 800 <laughs> political power on Academy of Sciences. This feels like perhaps something you do later game, or maybe invest in a couple, but for a small research speed buff, I'm just wondering how many of these you can actually afford to get. So next, we move on to the Air Force branch, which in total is pretty modest. It doesn't try to expel itself into something ridiculous. It's nice, and it has some interesting flavour. The Dev Diary begins by talking about how one of those six beginning national spirits is the Soviet Air Force, which, in no simple words, is completely awful. It's just terrible. People are dying, people are getting in accidents, there's no ability to do anything. It's terrible. So a large part of this focus tree branch is about fixing that national spirit, so it isn't as painful as it currently is, and allowing you to muster some kind of air force. What really is cool though is the small branch to the right, which allows you to work towards getting some women piloted plane aviation regiments. Specifically, they mention the one formed by Marina Raskova, which they all have aces for, they all have portraits for. It's very well done, and it's a nice little bit of flavour. Right, so thank goodness that was a short one, so we can quickly move into talking about the next one, the Navy branch. The Navy branch is, at the beginning, split down four key points, the different naval bases in the different seas you control. The Baltics, the Black Sea, the Arctic, and the Far East. As is typically followed in history, the Germans' main point was to kind of not destroy your navy, but to make sure that your ports and areas were blockaded, so you couldn't really do anything with the navy. That's why the initial four focuses are to do with defending up your bases, giving them anti-air, coastal forts, uh, radio detection, everything you need to ensure that the fleet can dock and be protected. Depending on how many of these places you've defended, the next focus, Expand Shipbuilding Plants, gives you a building slot and a dockyard. And I think this is the first time I'm going to start criticising. Personally, I feel that focus is a little too weak. One of the key points they said they were going for is having to make the tough decisions between which areas you're going to dedicate to. And if I went to such an effort of reinforcing four different naval bases at the start of the game, to say I only get four dockyards as a reward feels pretty weak when if I was just playing any generic minor nation, one of the first naval focuses I can do is get free naval dockyards for 70 days. It's almost on par with that focus, but this one takes infinitesimally longer. I'm just saying, maybe it could be buffed to add two dockyards per focus taken? I think eight dockyards would be a much more significant boost justifying taking those four focuses. But hey, what do I know? <laughs> maybe I'm, maybe they disagree, it's all good. So to the right side of that is also the bit of the PC of the USSR Navy, which is effectively about building up the ships instead of the dockyards. So moving on, a couple of those focuses are talked about in detail. Um, long range raiders will give you the cruiser submarines tech, and it adds a couple of K-class submarines to the production line so they'll already be started to be completed built. There's equally an additional one that allows you to get a carrier straight into the production line. 
This one is a little bit more um, necessary because carriers can take forever to build. So having one just immediately stuck onto your production line ready to be completed is pretty good all round. Right, with Navy branch done, that moves us on to the next branch, it's military branch. So the military branch is divided into two key sections. The one on the left they say is focused on defence, but it's also got some special projects in there, some interesting things to build. And on the right, it's about the army and the buffs for the individual soldiers you build. So starting at the far left, we have the military industry, which is of course building the military factories and production bonuses, but also you get some interesting tank templates. With this, of course, we get to have another look at the tank designer that they showed off. Of course, noting that there is still a question mark in the top right. I don't know what that's for. I don't think they've talked about it properly yet either. More mysteries beyond the horizon. <laughs> in addition, we also see the development of Tankograd, which was something they did leak prior that was going to be added to the game, which effectively means that the more things you build in the Far East and the Urals, specifically free military factories, you get an additional military factory built there. You know the deal, you buy free, you get one free. I said you buy free, you get one free. At the bottom of this section, we see the Merge Tanks and Material Plants focus. This is a focus that's actually reoccurred in the Air Force and the Navy branch as well. And this is because it's a, a reoccurring concept that was found across multiple different sections of the Soviet Union's industry. When you take these focuses, you're actually unlocking a set of decisions to start merging different branches and divisions of your research and industry to form better ones. In doing so, they show off quite the list of plant reorganizations you can do. And again, this is very peculiar. So they all cost 50 political power to get some buffs, some good, some okay. And there's so many of them. I mean, look at how many there are. There could be more for all I know. And they're all named rather obscure things, let's say. I look forward to the meta being, make sure you've done merge plant number 150 and 172, and then somebody does plant number 174, and gets banned. The joys of Hoi4 competitive multiplayer continue to elude us all. In addition, they do briefly show some of the designers you can get with their fantastic looking art to match. Here I'm noting, of course, that all of them do appear to be available without any restrictions. So I'm wondering if they're all just free to take whenever you want them. Maybe. So continuing with the defence and army branch, the next part of the defence branch is about the fortresses and the defensive lines you build up to hold back the Germans. The key choice you can choose between is a defensive line on the board with Poland, known as the Stalin line, or if you've, for some reason, you own Eastern Poland, which I don't know what deadly deals you've done to do that, you can form the Molotov line. Further down, we have the Leningrad Polytechnical Institute. In addition, there is also the Road of Life focus, which is the road that was used across the frozen water lakes to get into the Leningrad during its siege. And this will give you a spirit of some kind that gives you bonuses towards winter attrition and supply. This will be unlocked, of course, once the Soviets are attacked and they're pushing in on key vital cities. And last not but least for the defense branch, we have the Soviet Atomic Bomb Project, which is as straightforward as it seems. The Soviets want to build an atomic bomb. For me, this is one of the most fantastic focuses going because it just, it culminates in so many good ideas they've built up so far. So in order to take it, you need to have built seven academies of science, which were the uh, research academies we were talking about earlier, 50 PP each, you build them in different territories. If you have seven of them, you can begin uh, operations and bonuses towards researching nuclear technology. And it's the operation which is really interesting. With it, you gain a Soviet atomic bomb project, giving you an extra operative slot and a mission to infiltrate uh, probably the USA and steal their secrets to get another nuclear technology research bonus. I'm so happy that stuff from the resistance hasn't just been completely forgotten about and there is making a reoccurrence in this DLC because the Soviets and spying is like, it's a hand in hand formula. So thank goodness it does so show some aspects here. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think it's really cool. I'm a big fan. So flavorful. And on to the right side, which is going to follow through with your typical upgrading the red army to be the best army and not just a red debuff army. So the initial national spirit you get for the red army is its politicized military, 
which basically means that doctrine costs are not particularly good, and overall the soldiers are not the best, but they are fervently dedicated to their communist cause. One of the initial decisions you have to choose between when reforming the Red Army is whether you want to have a single, cohesive, professional, constrained army, or you want the ragtag bunch of lads, and you're going to get some Cossacks into your army. If you choose to go with the Cossacks and restore the Cossack units, the Red Army gets a bonus towards cavalry bonuses, which is pretty good all round, cavalry attack, cavalry speed, not a massive, but decent, as well as getting Lev Dovator, probably said wrong, but he's a great general that you can add to your list, and he gives you four cavalry divisions and an infantry division for free. On the flip side, Cohesion First gives you some better organisation and more training time, because a good army takes time. Moving on, we have the Rehabilitated Military, which has had some changes since its previous iteration. Now it's got a heavy focus on organisation and recovery rate, and you're going to have to wait a bit until you've dealt with Stalin before you can actually begin working on your army. They're going to stay weak for a bit. So we can see this here with the actual Spirit Military Organisation. Once it's taken, you're in it for the long haul, with experience just shot down, organisation shot down, it's all terrible and there's nothing you can do to fix it until you take the next focus down. So similarly, on the right side of the tree we have Desperate Measures, which is about the oncoming onslaught of Germany, and how you pretty much weren't prepared and have to funnel as much pain and energy to mobilise the men to fight them back. This gives you a year-long national spirit, where you have to quickly mobilise and get to work. It also unlocks lots of decisions that involve raising worker militias and labour forces to fight them back, so I think this is similar to the Silver Legion of America, when you're in a civil war where you can just spawn some units to rush to the front lines. Once you've completed that one year struggle and you've held out against the Germans to the last man, you can now learn from your failures and get the lessons of war, which is really about getting the good buffs and the rather famous Decision Order 227, or No Step Back, which is the namesake of the DLC. There is also a <laughs> rather odd... Uh, focus in the form of penal battalions, in which, if you really are struggling, you can force the convicts and prisoners, many of which I'm assuming came from the Purge, and just stick them in a battalion and send them off to fight. And uh, they even have their own unique battalion icons with the ball on chain. We've had bicycles, <laughs> we've had camels, and now we're just sending prisoners. I really wonder what the ultimate World War II combat force looks like. Right, sorry, so moving on, we've also got Organisation of the Partisans, which gives you an operative slot. So as I was saying earlier, thank you, Paradox, we've got that La Resistance has so much utility beyond just that DLC, and the Soviets are feeling the brunt of it. More operatives, more spying. The key point with this operative, of course, is to make sure that the Resistance is down, so that if you are pushing back into Germany, they aren't revolting against you. Okay, next branch, big branch, probably what a lot of people have been waiting for. It's the political branch. So, skipping over Stalin, they begin by talking about the internal affairs, and how you've got to sort out the issues within Russia to begin. The key point of the addressing internal affairs is about how propaganda plays a key point in ensuring that the Soviet people are on your side for the wars to come. The key mechanic they're bringing into this is propaganda campaign systems. These, I mean, as is with most things, they work around decisions, but they look fantastic by using actual Soviet posters as the buffs you're going to get for your country. So, in explanation, with the Ajit prop, which is the first focus you take, you unlock one place to stick a poster. The more focuses you take and the more you progress, the more poster slots you unlock, and the more campaigns you can do. Depending on which campaign posters you go through really can shape the campaign, so some of them will be to do with industry, which are probably the ones you're going to take earlier, and then some of the later ones are about pushing your men to defend the country, and these are about breakthrough and core defence. So managing your campaign and your propaganda is also going to help with the buffs for fighting against the Germans. There's going to be lots to manage. Also, for those who remember, positive heroism and collectivist propaganda are still here, and they are still mutually exclusive, which was kind of one of the 
only big choices you had playing as the Soviets previously. Depending on which one you choose, we'll give you an extra poster slot for that previous propaganda campaign, but the path you take will choose different posters and different campaigns that you're going to get. Right, are you still with us? Only two more branches to go. You can stay with us. Let's do this. The foreign politics branch, which was previously the paths to war, has been expanded rather considerably. So, on the far left, we have the Eastern Development Subbranch, which is about making sure your minor allies, we're talking Tano Tuva, is ready to become the next global superpower. Um, I'm hoping that it gives Tano Tuva nukes, it gives Tano Tuva 50 minerals, um, but assuming that isn't what it does, it's going to give you the focus to annex Tano Tuva. I'm sorry, it had to be done. Next up, we have the policy of collective security versus the policy of individual security one focusing on fearing Germany and one more so working with Germany. Kind of. The left branch working towards a defensive pact with France and the right pact working towards a defensive pact with Germany, each one at the very bottom giving war goal focuses against major fascist or democratic nations. The Dev Diary brings note to mention though that with Seek a Defensive Pact with the Allies, you're specifically focusing on France to propose a Union of Mutual Assistance, which is a non-aggression pact and a guarantee. The really interesting point of flavour that comes with collective security is that France is a little bit of a diva, and if you ask them if they want the Defensive Pact, they say, ho ho ho, hold on here, what about Poland? And they come back with a counterclaim, asking if you'd be willing to invite Poland into this triage, this, this trinity between the Soviets, the French, and the Polish. You can choose to accept or deny, and the French will have to deal with your consequences and make their decision. The middle focus branches for foreign policy are to do with the Baltics and the Middle East, which were previously also in it with the Far East diplomacy, I think. Um, they're pretty much the same, but as is with a common reoccurrence with all of these, things have gone from just standard war goals into decisions allowing you to go to war. In addition, we can note a cheeky Scandinavian world conquest in the bottom left, if you're so inclined. On the right, we have the traditional claims on Poland, claims on Bessarabia, and on the bottom right, I think there's something there to do with taking control over the entire Balkans. I wonder if one of them is to do with puppeting, and one of them is to do with just annexing, or inviting them to your faction. I'll be interested to see how that works. It's good to note that some of these focuses are only 35 days, so your plan to spread communism all over isn't so dramatic as it used to be. In addition, Middle East diplomacy also starts to influence Saudi Arabia. And the final part of your foreign diplomacy is what to do about Japan. Japan, Japan, the fawn in the East. So the right side, in terms of reconciling Japan, is pretty straightforward. You give them back territory that they so desire, and you can mend the relationship to ensure that they don't stab you in the back. What's far more interesting though, is attacking the Japanese. In this, you get to now pick which China you want to support in their war against the Japanese, whether that be the uh, PRC, People's Republic, uh, the Kuomintang with Chiang Kai-shek, or you can go for Xinjiang. Xinjiang is the horse you're going to back, and that one has quite the bit of flavour attached to it. If you choose to back Xinjiang, you'll begin a series of decisions and works towards integrating them to become more and more a part of the Soviet Union's influence. In doing this, your end goal is perhaps to have them, Xinjiang, become the real China, smiley face, and become a part of the Comintern, effectively making you the primary dominant force in Asia. They really do call it the Gobi Gambit, and I look forward to seeing other people make videos about ensuring Xinjiang's victory. And lastly, once you've had fun ensuring that the Xinjiang government is ruling all of China, you've got the centre branch, which is the, a, let's say, the official political path you go down if you want to choose Stalin. So this political branch is very much so focusing on one thing, and that is Stalin's paranoia, which has its own entire mechanic dedicated to it. Traditionally, the Great Purge was like a giant focus that took a year to complete, in which lots of people would die randomly. Now, the Great Purge is a dynamic event that happens in response to Stalin's paranoia. 
At some point in 1936, Stalin is going to get very worried about Trotskyists and other people trying to usurp him. And so Stalin's paranoia becomes a traitor on him and you're going to have to take decisions and focuses to lower his paranoia, to calm the man down. And the trait we give has Stalin's paranoia increase by one every week. So that means it goes up by 10 per focus. We also get a callback to that starting NKVD um, advisor that you have in 1936, and he also increases Stalin's paranoia by one per week. That's a lot worse. So yeah, getting rid of this guy is very much so a priority once uh, once old uh, Yosef starts to think things are happening behind closed doors. So what happens if you can control his paranoia? And Yosef goes cuckoo on you. Well, if your paranoia goes above 25, you're going to get possibly a minor Great Purge event. So just a minor one. This typically will involve getting some sort of uh, smaller debuff or a single character is going to be purged. Not an entire plethora, just an advisor, a navy chief, a field marshal. You can choose to avoid this by spending political power, but it will increase your paranoia even further and cause things to spiral out of control. If paranoia goes above 75, then you're going to get the great purge events that we remember so well from that massive focus there used to be. This can involve taking out entire groups of people or entirely destroying division and aircraft designer companies. It, it can be uh, cataclysmic. Here we can see some examples of what you might get. Um, Ground-based training for planes. Um, your bureaucracy is terribly understaffed. Goodness, that one's terrible. As all this is going on, they've added a fantastic uh, immersion flavor thing where on this graphic we see for Stan's paranoia, as characters are killed in his purge, some of their portraits will actually appear here. So I, I can see Trotsky in the bottom right there. Um, some of them are actually generic ones. Not all of them will have custom. But yeah, many are being crossed out and taken down. So in order to get rid of this terrible situation, the top half of the center focus branch is dedicated to getting rid of the paranoia. Many of these focuses are actually timed, so you can't do them in quick succession. You're going to have to wait between them to do them, and that means the paranoia can't just disappear overnight. On the bottom right, we can see a focus called Behead the Snake, with uh, poor Trotsky looking like he's seen better days. What this does is it opens up two operations to kill Trotsky in Mexico. Um, both of them are historical. The bottom one is Ray Trotsky's villa, which was the initial one that happened, which failed. And then the top one is the subtle assassination with an ice pick. That's the second one, and that one succeeded. And now, for the final, 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 final part of the Dev Diary, Stalin's cult of personality. Once Yosef has kicked the ghosts from behind him out, and he's got his head on the right track, he'll start to build up the official cult of personality that Stalinism has as we know it. Each of these focuses will give you a variety of buffs that go directly onto the portrait character of uh, Josef Stalin. Um, and these buffs are like very strong. Um, justify war goal time, political power gain. One of them gives you like a, a specialized tank design. Weekly war support going up by 0.20%. I mean, all of this stuff is just so powerful and it is the foundation for your world conquest. And then once all is said and done, the final focuses are taken, the final wars have been won, and all is complete and the vision of the communists have won, you can get the father of nations, the faithful servant of Lenin, and the architect of communism. My man is buffed out to the extreme, and it is with that glorious victory that the Dev Diary ends. Um, so thank you very much for watching. There was so much to take in there. I, God knows how long this video is going to be. But there's, there's so much in there, isn't there? And that's only half of it. We've got the alternative communist paths, and we've got the democratic, the fash, the, all the rest of it to come. And that might be next week. So if you want to see it next week, and you want to see it here, this is the place to subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching. Tell me what you think about this. I mean, I think it's fantastic. I think this is possibly the best major focus tree they've done so far, assuming it all comes to fruition. Very complex in parts. 
definitely something that has to be played to be rated, but it looks to be the best so far, yeah. Alright, and on that, I'll say adios, adios, adios. What are you still doing here? The video, the video's over. It was already long enough. Go on. Chew. Chew. Bye.